Hello and welcome to a special edition of Quantum. Over the next two weeks, we'll journey the length of exotic Egypt, a rapidly expanding country of 55 million people. The ancient land of crumbling ruins now faces an environmental catastrophe of its own making. Richard Smith uncovers the future of a nation whose survival depends on the water from just one river, the miraculous River Nile. I had read that visiting the city of Cairo was a little like meeting your lover when she had become old. But this was a city that I had never laid eyes on. Now I was here, I wasn't sure which way to look. You have a good day, sir. You will see you and have a nice day. I'd come to ancient exotic 20th century Egypt in search of its future. A two-week tour of a different kind to feel the environmental pulse of one of the international community's oldest members. A country with the remarkable legacy of 7,000 years of continuous civilization. This was the golden land of the pharaohs. The fertile valley that had cradled a great civilization. And the bountiful river Nile that had allowed it to flourish. Surely here, in the middle of the desert, I would find a nation that had learnt to live within its means. Where people had cultivated a respect for the river that had kept them alive for seven millennia. And I'd come to see this, the Aswan High Dam. The dam that had cemented the bond between the people and their river. But has that bond become a shackle? Has the country's saviour become its curse. Egypt is heading towards a new and uncertain millennium. Despite one of the largest dams in the world, by the year 2000, the water of the Nile will be in short supply. Within 30 years, 100 million Egyptians could be fighting for what's left. The stage is set for a tragedy of biblical proportions. To get a feeling for how precious the Nile is to Egypt, you should take a stroll in the desert. 96% of the country is like this, all the way from Libya to the Red Sea, from Sudan to the Mediterranean. Today it's a cool 40 degrees. The sand is biting at my ankles, the air cracks my lips and is drying my throat. Then right in the middle slices this ribbon of life. On this river has rested a nation's reason for existence. The Nile has supported life, carried people, even ferried the blocks of the pyramids themselves. The river has been the country's artery, and the water, its lifeblood. But Egypt's heartbeat has always been the flood. 
Once a year, monsoonal rain beating on the ground far away in the heart of Africa feeds a raging torrent that tumbles out of the highlands, picking up soil and mud as it goes. Every summer, for as long as there is history, the swollen river would flood into Egypt, the water rising over the banks and covering the fields. For two months, the Nile Valley would become a broad, muddy lake. Farming would stop. People and animals would retreat to high ground. But as the flood slowly receded, the water left behind its heavy cargo of silt. Year after year, layer after layer, building and enriching the fabric of the soil. It was the cycle that built Egypt itself. This, believe it or not, is part of the ancient Egyptian taxation system. It's called a nilometer because it was used to record the flow of the Nile. Now, every year as the flood approached, the water would rise against these marks on the wall. A good strong rise would indicate a good strong flood, which foretold of a bumper harvest, and just as inevitably, a rise in taxes. What was less predictable were the years that the heartbeat of the Nile was too strong. When an angry flood raced through the country, washing away entire villages, their crops and their inhabitants. And there were other years when the river's pulse was weak, when the flood didn't come at all and famine would grip the land. This was the rhythm of the river which dominated Egypt until the 20th century. In 1960, a new and independent Egyptian nation embarked on an engineering project to rival the pharaohs. The plan was to secure the country's destiny by controlling the river. It was called El Saad El Ali, better known as the Aswan High Dam. The scale was immense. A rock-filled wall, 17 times larger than the largest pyramid at Giza. Big enough to hold two complete floods and push back the waters of the Nile into a lake 500 kilometres long that stretched over the border into Sudan. A vast technological achievement, this dam was designed to finally free the agriculture of Lower Egypt from its dependence on the annual flooding of the Nile. Opened by President Nasser and Nikita Khrushchev, the harnessing of the waters also told the death knell for ancient Nubia. 100,000 Nubians were evacuated as their kingdom slipped below the rising waters of the new Lake Nasser. Engineers scrambled to move the archeological treasures to higher ground. Those that failed to find new homes were lost beneath the largest artificial lake in the world. It was a sacrifice to the greater good of abundant water and hydroelectricity. But by trapping the flood behind the dam wall, Egypt had tampered with its sacred river and its only water supply. The warnings of scientists and technicians were ignored as the country set course for the modern world and everything it had to offer. Hello. Pleased to meet you. Over here. Now, on a smaller scale, I was setting sail to see if that course had been true. A personal voyage of discovery to see how Egypt was faring after the flood. Luxor seemed to be a good place to start. This was the site of the ancient capital of Thebes, part of the Egypt I'd always wanted to see firsthand. It was on these banks that so much of what I've come to know as civilization first blossomed. And the 
one precious resource that had made everything possible, art and architecture, church and state, science and engineering, was the water of the Nile. But my first discovery was a simple one. Swanning about in a felucca was best done with plenty of cushions. And although my talkative boatman, Mr Ali, wasn't giving too much away, it was obvious that I wasn't the first traveller in these parts. The Nile is a traveller too. With no catchment and no tributary within Egypt, every drop of the water I was sailing on comes from somewhere else. Rain that falls deep in equatorial Africa races through nine nations as it works its improbable way north through the desert to the sea. Here it fans out and drops what's left of its cargo of silt to form the broad green delta of its own creation. In the symbolism of the ancients, the delta of Lower Egypt became a lotus flower and the Nile its stem. But these days in Egypt, the lotus is hard to find. Without a memory of the past, it's hard to realise what's gone until confronted by what's not here anymore. This is the tomb of a man called T, who died more than 4,000 years ago. The walls record the world of a people who lived in tune with the rhythm of the river and relied on the biology it supported. Wall after wall of botanical delights and crisp zoological anatomies. It was hard to reconcile the veritable menagerie of African animals that lived here with the human-dominated reality outside. Hippopotamus have long gone. The blue lotus, symbol of Egypt, is rare. Papyrus no longer grows wild in the land where paper was invented. Nile crocodiles, which lurked in the shallows, have been pushed back behind the Aswan Dam. But now, even this history is under threat. The dynasties of the pharaohs span some three and a half thousand years, and their monuments have lasted twice that long. Now, within a single generation, many of these imposing structures have started crumbling away from the inside. At Luxor's colossal Karnak temple, the porous rock is acting like a wick to suck up moisture from beneath the temple. As it evaporates at the surface, salt crystals break the weakened rock apart, forming crusty carbuncles that flake and crumble to the ground. Most tourists walk by, overwhelmed by the size and oblivious to the rot that eats away at this irreplaceable heritage. One by one, the colossal columns of the famous hyperstyle hall are turning from hieroglyphics and stone to stucco and cement. Nearby excavations reveal the extent of the problem, a general rise in groundwater which is carrying salts to the surface. The water table of the entire Nile Valley has risen because of the high dam sitting upstream and the year-round supply of water it provides. The creeks and groans of Sakia are now heard year-long, together with the cacophony of mechanical horsepower that drives an endless rhythm of irrigation. This has increased the area under cultivation and lifted productivity by nearly 30% since the dam was completed in 1971. Even the crops have changed. 
to export earning varieties like sugarcane, rice and cotton, which need up to 10 times as much water as the ones they replace. Yes, I know. Thank you. Very good. I couldn't deny that the cane was sweet, but at what bitter price? With no flood to flush the fields clean, over-irrigation has rendered a third of the country's prime farming land either barren from salt or severely waterlogged. This comes as no surprise to Dr. Adley Boucher. They think that if you give more and more water, then that would give them more yield and improve their soil, and so, which is not true at all. Another aspect is that the drainage system is not always proper, and so that causes water logging, and that will give salinity. And uh, I would say that it costs much, much more to remedy that than to prevent it. The government has been forced to spend millions of dollars each year installing drainage systems that feed the salty water back to the river. These changes are not obvious at first glance. For the casual visitor, rural life gives a pretty good imitation of not having changed for thousands of years. I'd already seen these same scenes in the tomb of Mr T. beast still turn the rich brown earth of the Nile Valley, but with silt now settling behind the dam wall, these farmers work soil that's become ancient history, a relic of floods past. But while the high dam broke the cycle of flood and replenishment, it did offer some 20th century solutions. Water released for irrigation turned the turbines which generated the electricity that powered the factories that made the fertiliser that replaced the silt. Drought and flood had been beaten and a new cycle was complete. for his equally talkative brother to drive me down river. But switching from Palooka to taxi soon made me realise that travelling by boat might be a slow way of seeing Egypt, but it was still the safest. Not only the river, but the whole country seems to be on the move. Growth in agriculture wasn't the only promise of the high dam. Industry needs water too, and a familiar skyline dominates city outskirts where date palms used to sway. Two thirds of Egypt's industry is tied to the river by the need for water just as much as any crop. 180 industrial plants send their untreated wastewater back into the river. Most of our factories are now 10, 15 years old and they are using old technology. And even when they were starting industrialization of Egypt, they were not buying new uh, factories, but they were buying factories which are out of date. So most of our technology which we are using need to be upgraded and updated.
The Russian-built coke factory at Helwan is no exception. The process of quenching coke for use by the adjacent steelworks demands massive quantities of water. Only so much turns to steam. The rest carries away highly toxic byproducts like cyanide and phenol. Not many include the only coke factory in the Middle East on their tour itinerary. But this place is special for other reasons. It's one of those rare industries in Egypt to make a serious attempt at treating and recycling its wastewater. In the industrial sector, this is the only uh, treated plant is now constructed. And it is constructed from 1989 till now it is uh, working very efficient. A cocktail of fuming phenols and festering sewage might stink in the physical sense. But it's a brave demonstration in a developing country of putting your money where your morals are. Most muck from other factories still finds its way back to the Nile. If you have 180 factories that dispose of their effluents in the Nile, and you tell them overnight, if unless you, you, uh, you don't dispose of uh, your effluents, treat it according to certain um, uh, standards, we're going to close down your factory. So you're talking about the millions and millions of people will be out of job overnight. So you can't really do that. And once you give a grace period just because you cannot enforce the law, then the law loses its uh, significance. Back on the water, nearly two and a half thousand kilometers from where the White and the Blue Nile joined, the river has changed color again. No longer the wild stream that saw the heart of Africa, this murky water has become a captive that still has its major challenge to face as it runs the gauntlet of humanity. The Nile Delta is home to most of the country's arable land and two-thirds of its population. This is where the Nile is needed most and where it's put under its greatest strain. The last few decades here has seen a threatening change in land use. The security of the dam has allowed the population to explode, spilling out over more than 6% of its precious farming lands. In 1984, the Minister for Cabinet Affairs was forced to take action. We saw clearly in 1984 that a crime is being committed and we are destroying the source of production not only for this generation but for the future generation and we had to stop that we had to go into a fight a fight in the political parties and a fight into the parliament until we passed the law which prevents the building of land on the agricultural land as any real estate agent knows when you can't build out, you build up. Horizontal expansion has turned into vertical expansion. Hamlets into high-rise. Even so, the 56 million Egyptians alive today will be sharing their small amount of living space with a lot more people in the future. 75 million by the year 2000. 100 million by the year 2025. Meanwhile, the amount of arable land remains finite. Many families can no longer support themselves on their increasingly small subdivisions. With 25% of all jobs available only in Cairo, the alternative is clear. Exodus to the city. Another cycle is complete. the largest city in Africa. 
the largest in the Middle East. Straddling the confluence of these two worlds as effortlessly as it does the Nile. The city of a thousand and one nights and as many minarets echoes to a violent past. A past where crusading knights cross swords with the mighty Saladin. Where Persian fought Arab, Turk fought Persian and French fought Turk. Even Napoleon ruled here until expelled by the British. Now Cairo is under invasion again this time from the human tidal wave swelling in the countryside. In less than a century, the population has risen from 1 million to well over 12 million. Buildings are so densely packed and vegetation so rare that there is now a patch of green space less than the size of a matchbox for each resident. The metropolis has become a megacity and it can't cope some startling warnings that the rest of the world seems determined to ignore. Coming next, Egypt reclaims its future, turning sand into soil and building new cities in the desert. But for every solution, a new and even greater threat looms. Part two of our environmental tour through Egypt next week on Quantum. I do hope you can join us. Until then, good night. <laughs>